Uh, hello, my name is Mark Yarbrough. This is Prasant Anbalagan. Um, Anbalagan? Yes, sorry. And we're going to co-present today on a machine learning use case in the program management problem domain. Uh, so this is targeted not at developers or people who are advanced in machine learning, but more of a walkthrough of an initial use case, grabbing some data, preparing it, seeing how practical machine learning would be for our use case. So uh, I'm with the program management team at Red Hat, and we're, uh, our primary mission is to guide multiple product releases through development and test and through ship. And so this means there are a lot of dependencies across a lot of diverse systems. Frequently, always, those systems work differently and they don't talk to each other. So the problem we have is how to, how to anticipate and manage risk for heterogeneous uh, systems like that. And, um, and that turns out to be complicated by the fact that most of the target dates in play are constantly in flux. So we have to do ongoing risk analysis against a set of changing target dates. So how could you deal with a problem like that? Well, if you have a lot of systems that don't work together well, maybe you just go to one system and get rid of the problem that way. Uh, that's what we call the dream on scenario. You could also assign a dependency management guru to understand how all the systems work and be able to manage them kind of manually. You could write some rules-based code in the form of scripts or plugins or other applications. Or you could try to point some machine learning at the problem. So that's what we're going to explore today. For our use case, is machine learning a viable option? Do we have the data that we would need to do the training that the machine learning would require to be effective. Uh, if we do have that data, what steps would we need to undertake as non-developers and non-data scientists to get it ready for a process? And then once we have some training data prepared, how would we um, get that uh, into a training algorithm? And that's where we leaned on the AI Center of Excellence with uh, Dr. An Balogan. Okay, once we answer that question, uh, then we would make a determination, do we want to add machine learning to our risk uh, analysis process? So what we'll do today is I'll talk a little bit about the problem space we have. Uh, you may see that it resembles a problem space that you know or, or possibly not. Then we'll go through preparing the training data for the, the, the machine learning process. I'll go through the first pass in a fair amount of detail and it won't be super technical. It's just showing you the practical steps that we actually did to get the data ready. Um, and then if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about some of the iterations. Once you do the initial data prep, what do you want to consider doing next? How many times will you iterate? Then Prasanth is going to talk more about the actual training using the libraries that do the uh, training model development, uh, how you measure to know when you're done, and how that fits into the AI library strategy. So let's look at the problem space. Let's start out simply. Let's say that you've got an issue tracking system. Uh, we'll just pick a generic system and say that in the hundreds of thousands of issues that could be in this issue tracking system, maybe one of them represents a new capability. And that's a new capability that you care about for whatever reason. So when I talk about these systems, some examples of that would be Jira, Bugzilla, GitHub or GitLab, Trello, Rally, um, and there are lots of others as well. Now, just to complicate things, there's probably not one system. There's probably at least two. And within those systems, what they're trying to achieve is pretty much identical in function and different in every detail. So for example, in Bugzilla, a new capability might be represented by something called a future feature. That would have a state. What state is the development of that future feature in? And it would be uh, complemented by custom flags and other attributes that would tell you more about the state. In JIRA, you might have something called uh, an issue type of feature request. It would have a combination of status and resolution that are roughly equivalent to the Bugzilla state, but of course different. Um, and then you would have custom workflows and other attributes wrapped around that issue to tell you how it's doing. You could probably have one or more schedules that want to incorporate both of these new capabilities. And I've drawn them as dotted lines here to, il to illustrate that you have a schedule, and the schedule is the milestone. Success of that milestone depends on both of these new capabilities being ready. But it's a dotted line because it turns out tracking system A, tracking system B, and the scheduling repository don't talk to each other. So we know that there's a dependency, but there's no easy way to link the dependency in a way that's uh, predictable. 
So let's extend the problem set a little bit further for this one case and say, uh, what if we were to abstract into a logical table all of the dependencies, or at least all of the critical dependencies on new capabilities associated with this schedule? Then we could have a table that, at the very least, would need to contain uh, a pointer to the new capability issue in the, in the native tracking system. So that's why the line's no longer dotted. And it would need to uh, be conditioned by the target date. When do we need this thing to be ready? So we need to know at least those two pieces of information. And then what we want to understand is, based on those two pieces of information, what is our risk at this moment? Well, it turns out there's not a schedule in flight. Usually there's on the order in our domain of 80 to 100. Depending on how many, uh, how granular you want to get, there could be hundreds of schedules. So there could be hundreds of tables. And then just to spice things up, there's usually more than two systems. So at Red Hat, we use Bugzilla. We have several JIRA instances. A lot of these have been in production for years or decades, have hundreds of thousands or millions of um, issues relating to community development and also product development. So now let's take a look at, given that problem domain, how would we say, okay, maybe we have a use case. We've heard about machine learning. How do we go from having a use case to figuring out if we're a viable candidate for machine learning? So this is where we conferred with the AI Center of Excellence, understood a little bit about the facilities that were available, um, and then made a few uh, early decisions. Now we're gonna go through some slides that are fairly detailed about just the mechanics. This is not theory, this is not advanced, this is just the mechanics that we followed to get this data ready. Uh, but in a nutshell, we're gonna be looking at uh, the case where we need to find or fabricate a large data set to feed the machine learning algorithms. Uh, we don't really know beforehand how large the data set needs to be. Uh, we're guessing that two million records is probably great. We're guessing that 10 records is probably not enough, but we don't really know until we do some training how many we actually need. Uh, and just to finish that thought, we're gonna be munging this data, so I'd like it to be human readable. I'd like to be able to look at it and understand what I'm looking at, but at the same time, by the time we get it into a machine learning algorithm, it's gonna to have to be in a format that that algorithm understands. So we're gonna do this following example using no programming at all, just munging things around in a Google Sheet. So if you remember the picture we looked at that had the fairly complex problem domain, let's zoom in on one of the dependencies in one of the tables associated with one of the schedules. Remember that had a pointer to the issue, it had a target date, when do we need this thing to be ready, and what we want is the risk. So if we look at the transformations we're gonna to need to do, to train, we're gonna to need to create training samples, and we're gonna to need to provide a value for the risk to check the training. Uh, later on, when we're doing prediction, we're gonna transform the information in the same format, but what we want is the output of the risk. So just consider that as we look at the next uh, few pictures. So of all those different systems that we've got, let's choose one. First one we choose, uh, in this case, is the JBoss JIRA instance. This has been in production at uh, Red Hat for over 10 years for both community and product. Has hundreds of thousands of issues in it. We're talking about new capabilities, not bugs, not tasks, but new capabilities. Things like a new API, a new protocol, something that your product may want to leverage in that product as soon as it's ready. So in JIRA, the rough mapping of new capabilities to issue types would be feature requests, business requirements, and enhancements. And because there's so many of these issues in the system, we're gonna try just grabbing the ones in 2018. They are the newest ones, um, and we'll see if we get enough data. So this will be anything that was opened after uh, January 2018, and we took the snapshot November 18, uh, 2018. So we're getting almost a full year, and then we're getting a variety of states. Some of them may be open, uh, some of them may be in tests, some of them may have been rejected. So hopefully we're gonna get enough data and we're gonna get a spread of values that'll be representative for a training set. So the next step after choosing the data source for our issues would be to go grab the data. This is like getting the first raw data that we're gonna start munging. So in this case, we just went to the JIRA system and issued uh, a JIRA a JQL query to get all the feature requests, business requirements, and enhancements since the start of the year. And recall this was issued in November 18. So we get that bucket of uh, issues. We definitely want the status and the resolution because between the two of them, they kind of tell you the state of a JIRA. 
And there are probably other fields of interest. We probably want to know the priority of the JIRA. There could be other things like target release, uh, due date, et cetera. So we probably want to grab things that make sense. We don't want to grab everything in the JIRA because there's a lot. Export all of those to a CSV file, import that into a Google Sheet, and that's where we can begin to prepare the data for the training process. So we executed that query and we got 5,600 issues. Uh, is that enough data? We don't know. It's less than 2 million. It's more than 10. Once we run the training, we'll find out if it's enough or not. So here's a, a detailed slide of what we did. The JIRA query showing the different issues that we got in the fields. Dump that to a, a Google Sheet. And then you can start to see at a glance some of the parameters we're going to be dealing with. The uh, priority appears to be available for most of the JIRA. It could be important. The status is present for all of the issues. It's definitely important. Resolution sometimes is a complement to status, and you need both of them to know the actual state of the, uh, of the JIRA. But now we're starting to see an interesting, interesting pattern. For a lot of the cases, uh, the resolution is not there yet. It's too early. They haven't filled it in. So we've got some data that's sparse, important but sparse. Some things that might also be interesting would be the creation date. Um, we haven't really figured out how to use that yet, but it may matter if a JIRA has been open a year versus a, a day in terms of its state. Uh, and then things that might be interesting, like target release, a quick glance tells us that while that might be useful information, we can't rely on it. It's too sparse. So we kind of throw that out to get started. So let's do our first pass at preparing the data that we grabbed. And so what we're going to do is ask Prasanth what kind of training we're going to be doing. He's going to say we'll be doing supervised learning, linear regression. And so we need to target that as our format. Um, and we're going to grab, just to start, the status and the resolution, just to kind of calibrate the process. If we get this data ready for a machine learning algorithm, uh, will we get a result that's useful? And our, okay, our original uh, query, that 5,600 records we got, turned out there were separate, 30 separate uh, and distinct values of status and 15 values of resolution. So once we convert that to the one hot format that we talked about, and again, on the top is just a screenshot of a, a Google Sheet. We're just doing this directly in a Google Sheet, creating these one hot values. So the, the green 30 columns on the left are the status values. 15 columns on the right are the resolution value, including blank or not available. And then we have to assign the risk, that last column. We export that to a CSV file, which is shown on the bottom. So 5,600 plus lines of the zeros and ones that you see. Give that to Prasanth for training. And he'll talk more about that. Okay. All right. There are various iterations that are in the presentation that you can uh, review. But we're going to turn it over to Prasanth now. Thank you, Mark. Oh, I feel like a news anchor with all the wires going out. So, so uh, I'm Prasanth, and uh, I'm from the uh, AI Center of Excellence team at Red Hat. And we have my wonderful teammates out here. So any questions directed to them. So, so uh, we had Mark walk you through the first half of the process. When you're trying to move from like a use case to a machine learning solution to address that particular problem. So that's more like a user's perspective. Like you come up with a problem definition and then uh, prepare the data that you feel like is relevant to address that solution to that problem. So this, the next half of the journey is uh, it's more like you put, put on the hat of a data scientist and see what approach do I select. By approach, in simple terms, I mean like what statistical algorithm do I use? And then how do I validate it? Like, say the algorithm works fine on my current data set, like, will it work on like future data set? How do I test that? 
and then like kind of like go in a loop and keep improving the model until like you get a certain prediction accuracy that fits your process. And once the model is ready and if it works fine, then it's like handing it over to the team or like that's more like a model serving, like where they start integrating that into their existing process. I'm sorry. So how do you pick an approach to solve a particular use case? Well, you start, first start by looking at the data and see like, uh, is it well defined? Like, can I label the data? And do I know there's some kind of relationship across the different features or like the input and the output columns? So if you have that, then you're, it's more like supervised learning. But if you're not, if you don't have like a, a good uh, knowledge about the data, it's more about like turns to unsupervised, where you're uh, applying techniques to learn more about the data. So uh, in this case, like, uh, so say even if you choose the model, like you decide, okay, I'm gonna use like random forest or deep neural networks, so then you have to go implement the code, like pick up the infrastructure to deploy it, and then like train it, and then get, go to the process of like serving it. So this is where like AI library comes in place. So that's uh, an open source collection of AI components. So that has like uh, pre-packaged like machine learning algorithms and solutions. So solutions for common use cases we found at Red Hat. So it not only comes with the algorithms, but it also has like supporting libraries that lets you handle like the deployment or like the storage or, or other subtasks that revolve around a typical machine learning experiment. So the, the AI library is part of a, a much bigger project called Open Data Hub, which is a machine learning as a service platform that's built on top of uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes. So I'll come to, I'll explain AI library in detail like uh, if time permits at the end of this talk. But uh, this is like the uh, structure of AI library. Man, I thought it would be cool to point out, yeah. So let's focus on the list of algorithms that's uh, present in AI library at the moment. So for the data set that Mark handed over, like that was, Definitely the supervised learning because he cleaned out the data to make my life easier. So, and uh, anytime in supervised learning, if you, if you are like predicting like uh, a number, a real number, a real numerical value, the easy way to start is like regression that kind of tells you if there's like a linear or a nonlinear uh, pattern within your data. So what we did here, we used correlation analysis to kind of study the data that Mark handed over. So we found that there was like a strong linear relation between the input and the output column. So we decided, okay, we had to move from correlation analysis to regression because correlation analysis just tells you that there is a strong relation, but it doesn't have the predictive capabilities. So we have had to implement the linear regression model Yeah, so uh, here's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. here's the uh, graph that shows like what's a linear regression is. So you, a very simple case is you have like one input column and the output, and you're trying to see like, can the input predict the output? Say like, if the input increases, can, the out, can I say like the output increases as well? Or if the input decreases, can I say the output is gonna decrease too? So, in a simple case, you would have like one input column and one output column, but in our case, it was a little bit more than one. That's like close to 50 or so, and we had like to predict the risk value. So that ended up being a, a multivariate regression model, meaning that I had multiple input columns and I had to predict the risk or the output. So note that like, uh, the days left until deadline. So initially we thought, we thought it could be like, it's gonna be a, a time factor, like the number of days, but then we kind of like turned it into like a binary data. So kind of like classified as, is the deadline, 
in, within two days, or was it within a week, or was it within a month? So you could actually go with a, a logistic regression if you think like it's it's a binary data, and you're not actually fitting a straight in, but more like a squiggly line. But in this case, we, we knew that there was a linear relationship, so we went ahead with, uh, uh, we implemented uh, the scikit, using scikit-learn in Python, a uh, linear regression model, and uh, so that was the output. So all the coefficients that you see there, you kind of like, that goes with each of the input columns that you use in the data. Okay, okay so now you have the model, but, uh, how do you know it's good? So to start with, we divided the data set into like two buckets, like 80% and 20%. So 80% is like the data you use to learn the, the line that best fits your data. And the next 20% is what you use as a, like a validation or a prediction data set. Kind of take this model, apply it to the rest 20% and see if it fits good, does it fit good? So how do you validate that? So that there are like lots of predictive, like measures of predictive accuracy, but the simplest one being like, you just look at the predicted value and see how close it is to the actual value. So that's called like an absolute error, and it has to be as close to zero as possible. And in our case, it turned out to be like uh, 0 0.09, so it was fairly good. So now like we have, so we decided the approach, we had the model, uh, it works on our data, and uh, what's left? So we have to just hand it over to Mark so that he can integrate that into his product, or like into his process, and also like we wanted to take out the algorithm or the model and push it into AI library so that any user who wants to use it for their use cases, not necessarily a risk analysis, but like a regression model, like he can just leverage this, like send data to the AI library deployment and get the result out back. Oh. So let me, uh, do we have time? Yeah. So uh, let me explain uh, the workflow with AI library. So this is like the simple serving model that we have. You save the data to a S3 compatible storage, then run the model, and then you could get the results. So we support like any S3 compatible backends like Ceph, AWS, and the model itself are like, you could either run them as like Python modules or like uh, you could make, uh, so we provide like REST interface, I mean REST APIs to just trigger the, uh, the machine learning code. And they get uh, executed as jobs on like a container application platform. And once the, Training is uh, training or the prediction is done. They, the results get pushed back to the uh, storage. So this is more like a, a sequence diagram. So the user would just save the data, like invoke the uh, action to open with. And if it's going to be a fairly simple thing, like polling the status of your job, it's going to just open with. It's going to do that by itself. If not, it's going to hand over the job to. Open shift and like kind of uh, execute it and push the results back to your storage. So, if you want to learn more about all the other algorithms that's out in the AI library, you could uh, go to like opendatahub.io and it's uh, you'll find it all the documentation over there. So note that like uh, Mark also mentioned that you could. In this first slide, he mentioned that you could also define a set of rules uh, <coughs> to find out if one input column could dictate an output column. So you could use like association rule learning, but that's for like well-defined set of associations. For things that are too randomized, you need like a more a machine learning process to go for. So finally, we come to the. Conclusion, and I'm on time. Good. Do you want to go? There? Yeah, so uh, the conclusion, did, did this approach work, did, or did machine learning work for the program management example? Yes, to start with. What do I say to start with is like, for the data set that we have, or the details that we have, 
it was more uh, like certain level of abstraction and it did work. So now the, now the next approach is to like keep expanding the data and include as more and more details that we want to capture the entire process that the program management team is trying to work on and keep improving on, on the model. So it's more like a, a iterative process that you prepare the data, the approach, then test the model, get the results, and keep going in a loop. So yeah, so in this journey, like moving from a use case to a machine learning solution, we kind of learned uh, a few things. So I'll, I'll probably explain on the modeling. So when it comes to the approach, always go from the simple to the more complex. Now if you know, okay, it's, it's a supervised learning, I wanna use like deep, uh, neural networks, deep neural networks, but it's go from the simple to the complex, life will be easier. And the validation is like the most important part. Like once you implement the neural network, don't put it on your resume or just don't go to your boss and tell her I've done it. Validate your model because that's the most important part. Does it work or not? And then keep improving like until you get to your expected accuracy levels. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.